I am Fred Marshall, and I too want to welcome everyone. It is, what is it, a few days before summer officially starts. And um, it is really a joy to, um, to meet you in this context and to celebrate this book. I'm going to do a litany of thank yous first, and then I'll say a few words about the process by which this book came to be. I want to thank all the contributing readers tonight. Jane Hirschfield, Alpha Weaver, Maya Jansen, Esther Lynn, Connie Wannick, and Jennifer Franklin, and Kim Stafford, who's here in video form with a recitation. You'll see also a brief bio of each of them in, in the chat. I also want to thank the over 120 poets who contributed their work to this, to this book. A thank you also needs to go out to Ginny Connors, the publisher of Grace and Books, the publisher of this book. Um, she really helped us make a beautiful collection in its physical format as well as its content. Speaking of physical beauty, the cover itself is extraordinary. It's by Netta Gorin and it's a magnificent and I think haunting painting and we thank her for that. If you open to the dedication page, you'll see three people to whom this book is dedicated. Peter, Jed, and Steffi. Those are the, the spouses of the various editors. Uh, and they put up with a lot as we did this work. I also want to thank Hudson Valley Writers Center and, and the people that, um, that Jenny Franklin just mentioned. But I want to thank the director, Jennifer Franklin, and the hard work of Christina and Sophia. Um, the, the array of workshops, the kind of events tonight, and the significant community outreach that uh, Hudson Valley does in, its re in the Hudson Valley region is really wonderful. And, and I would dare say it's made, these folks have made this um, center into a national literary treasure. I always, too, like to make a bow of thanks to, to poet Margot Taft Stever and her spouse Don um, for their visionary um, energy as well as commitment uh, in founding this center. And finally, in this litany, of course, I want to thank my dear friends, Jennifer Barber and Jessica Greenbaum, for our work together. Co-editing this anthology over the past two plus years has been an artistic joy and an exercise in pure literary friendship. Tolerance, curiosity, discovery marked our every Zoom meeting. From the beginning, by the way, I should also point out that, that, that it was Jenny Barber who invited me and Jessica to join her in this project. It was Jenny who had an idea that, you know, the time was right, the world needed an anthology of contemporary poems about trees. And, you know, for the first second when she said that, I said, that's odd. And then very gently, like the wind going through the leaves, I said, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> and that good idea sustained us for those two plus years. We established editorial parameters we wanted to find poems that had been published in the 21st century. Our thinking was to make a collection that would speak directly to present tense experience of the arboreal, as we might say in our, our high-minded moments. Um, it's true, our project coincided with the pandemic. This is not, however, pandemic poetry per se. The project was shaped by some of the pandemic constraints. And in the end, some of those constraints turned out to be a blessing in disguise. For instance, we did most of our work at finding poems online. And what we didn't find online, we all three of us went through our respective libraries, go paging through them and, and making copies to send to each other if the other person didn't have. Sometimes the public libraries did open up and, and some of us snuck in and got some work done that way. But most of it was, and I, I, I can't, can't. I came, I came up. up. Is everybody okay? Everybody okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, uh, it's it's some weird. Oh, weird. Oh, something's happening. Oh, There's an There's echo, echo Fred, Fred, so maybe we should mute ourselves. Yeah. Say again. Maybe everyone else but Fred should mute for right now. Okay. That's how's that sound? Good. Um, it, it occurred to me about a week ago that the real experience of this 
kind of gathering of poems the way we did. We were like hunter gatherers, you know, and we were looking for poems that would help us and others survive these hard times. We required unanimity in all of our affirmative decisions. We limited ourselves to American poets and poems because we realized very quickly that um, we had to take into consideration size and scope and cultural you know, proximities and distances. It could be other volumes, by the way. Um, we met, generally speaking, for a couple of hours every two weeks or so. We printed out reams of poems. We talked, we made jokes. And above all, we felt the fibrous strength of this art, this poetry that we all engage in, this, this work in our time, this whole work in our time and in space. We discovered within this topic, there was a longing to make sense of, or at least show, reveal, somehow embody the ethical, spiritual, and societal issues of our day. We found matters of life and death within these poems. Matters that range from the individual crisis to the crisis of the planet itself. If you look up the etymology of the word tree, you'll find that it traces itself back to the Indo-European root, E-E-R-U. That suggests, that root suggests something solid, steadfast. Interestingly enough, and by the way, root is kind of an interesting thing in itself, isn't it? But duro is a root for words like durable in English, or trough, or betrothed. It's also a cousin to the word truce. And most of all, maybe first cousin to the word truth. Truth itself, truth has a root-based cousin in the word tree. Tree is a cousin of truth. The trees in these poems bring us many truths, sometimes terrifying, sometimes consoling, sometimes inspiring. The structure of our evening together um, will be something like this. I'll turn over the mic. I'll turn over the mic um, to Jennifer Barbara, who will then tell us how the book is organized. And if those of you who have read the introduction, you know this organization is a thing of beauty. And it is, I think, Jenny's, um, Jenny should be the one to, to describe it. Um, she will then turn over the mic to Jess Greenbaum, who will introduce Maya and Maya's poem. Maya will read and Jess will follow up with a question or two and roughly, you know, um, let's say five to 10 minutes of conversation. That pattern will repeat itself throughout the night uh, with all of the writers and all the poems. And so the idea would be to have a, you think of this as a conversation among um, poets and friends of poetry. Um, at the end of the evening, if there's time and if there's need or desire, um, um, the, the floor will be open to questions and comments from the chat. The maximum um, amount of time this evening will be to 8.30. We'll probably stop before that, but that's as far as we'll go is 8.30 tonight, Eastern time. So then, for now, let me invite my dear friend and colleague, Jennifer Barber, to elaborate on um, her essay, Among Trees, is title. Je Jenny? Thank you, Fred. That was a great overview of our work together. And um, I just wanna say also what a great thing it was to collaborate with you and Jess over the past two years on this book. So I'll just talk a little bit about the book's organization, but I thought I would start with a quote from the biologist and nature writer, Bernd Heinrich in his classic book called The Trees in My Forest. He says, quote, trees are more than distant relatives. They are and have been our intimate associates throughout the whole of our evolutionary history. This idea of trees as our intimate associates underlies all of the poems in Tree Lines. The poems in the book's first section, Where You Are Planted, evoke the various trees we knew in childhood, whether they were Georgia pines 
or mulberry trees or hickory trees or magnolias, as well as the trees we've come to live among as adults in a rural area or in the midst of a city. The second part of the book is called One Tree and the poems in it zero in on the poet's relationship to a specific tree. Three of the poems you'll hear tonight are from this section. And in each case, you'll hear how a certain tree's existence informs the poet's own life in unexpected ways. The third section called Calendar is attuned to weather and season. The poems in this part of the book understand that trees are calendars, interconnected with our experience of passing time. The book's final section is called Listening, Telling. By listening, telling, we mean the poet's awareness of what a tree or trees might be saying to us, to itself, to other trees, and the lessons broadly defined that trees impart. So to begin the reading part, um, I'll turn things over now to Jess Greenbaum and she'll introduce our first reader. Hi everybody. Um, as you can see, the only problem I would have working with Jenny and Fred was trying to be as articulate and graceful as they um, I gave up soon, but uh, it was fun to keep trying. You know, just one of the great things about working on um, a collaboration, if you're a person who writes poems, you might have occasion to doubt your own work. I, I don't know, I've heard about it. Um, and one of the beauties of doing this work with other people is to know that what came together, I can honestly say is just terrific. And it's so fun to be able to flat out say that. Um, both the poets I'm gonna introduce hold in their work characteristics that I think um, make tree lines a big hearted and visionary collection. Their poems embrace the human condition with wit and play like branches in the wind and also with the gravity. Um, of a trunk and its roots in the dirt of real experience. Empathy and compassion come through for the people and the world around us, as does their brilliant perception of our relationship to them. Maya Jansen's poem, The Oldest Living Cherry Tree is Alive and Well, but Barely Able to Walk, tells you in its title a great deal about her sensibility. This poem first appeared in Guernica and shows up in her sparkling new collection on the Mercy Me Planet, the very first book published by the brand new press, Blue Edge Books, begun by Kathy Lee. Before that came the stellar murmur and crush. So Maya, uh, I invite you to read. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you all for being here. It's really an honor. The world's oldest cherry tree is alive and well, but barely able to walk. Word is the villagers have fashioned special sticks to prop it up, to keep its thousand year old hat from falling to the ground. Everyone wants to picnic beneath its waterfall and laugh about the petals that fall into their drinks. There's a Japanese word for that, for the progressive and manifest degrees of flowering and drunkenness beneath the boughs. Another word for roughly translated, you must put your nose right into the blossom to practice and perfect your bee. When I visited, I rode my bike past narrow canals and thought, just like Holland, where I've never been. Pedaled right through the middle of a discourse, two young scholars were having about flexibility as they leaned against the smallest tree in the orchard. Underfoot, the spring grass was an animal whose fur must never be cut. This by emperor's decree. It rubbed itself against the ankles of the revelers, 
the loud red ones and the quiet ones who stood there looking straight into the swirling cascade and saw up close how the world was made. Maya, I just came upon that couplet, seems for the first time that ends the poem so perfectly. Um, I love the poem and I love how the consideration of language um, really shows the girth of experience that the experience with the world's oldest tree can be communal, where it is, the villagers have fashioned special sticks to prop it up, but it's also so individualized. Um, the Japanese word for the experience of standing beneath a tree's waterfall um, as its petals fall in your drink. And um, I, I hear in the poem that articulation that our, our individual humanity joins us with other people. And in the poem, I feel making its way between those rows of couplets, a quiet call to unite the communal and the individual to fashion a propping up of what we love and might lose. I wonder if you can talk to us a bit about your relationship to poems as special sticks that you fashion. Have you uh, always known there was room for your wit and tone in your work? And was there any particular freedom you had to award yourself to write this astounding poem? Mm. Ah, let's see. Um, I, I think the first answer is that I don't think I ever know anything about the, the poem that's happening. Um, and uh, so there's there's element of surprise, um, which I'm guessing many of you uh, also experience. Um, this particular poem, um, I, I'm pretty sure that there was some laughing involved when I <laughs> When I felt like it was finished enough to send out, I also thought that it was perhaps ridiculous and overly whimsical, and I never thought it would be published. And so there was a laugh in sending it, and there was a laugh in having it taken. Um, once again, like not knowing what, what works, what, yeah, what is successful. Um, the poem also, I've never met the tree, although I lived in Japan for a while. I think I, I came to know of it after the horrible tragedy of the tsunami in uh, 2011, I think it was. Um, and I think there was something in the experience of the tragedy and so much sorrow and then encountering the description of this beloved tree in this in this village, this actual tree that people cared for so deeply, it, it felt like it spoke to this lineage, I guess, of uh, continuation, especially at that time of so much devastation and, and sorrow. Um, so as for your question about prop, like, how did you say that? So, <laughs> so um, I, I was wondering really about how poetry saves your life. I mean, oh. how is it <laughs> yeah. just that um, that's about your relationship to, to poems and yeah. um, how if, if there's a way to talk about it at all? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it's it's something to think that like that poetry does sort of provide the sticks for for propping us up. It has definitely poetry has definitely been that in my life um, of reading reading others' work and the, just finding my way through to my own voice through mm. other poets. And though the work can be uh, a tad solitary. Um, I it is not written alone. Is the is the feeling mm -hmm. that I have that like I read uh, a Jessica poem in the world and I'm then 
like there's a fever to get to the to the page to begin to to work with it like to sort of filter my my own work through others lenses so in that way yeah propped up thank you so much and that also speaks to anthologies and how we have this whole collection um and I just will end our little part of things by saying that the laughter, the laughter in the moment of creation, how, how thrilling that is and how great it was to hear about that. So thank you, Maya. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, and now I'm gonna introduce really briefly, Connie Wanick, um, with whom I have been carrying on a perfectly fabulous correspondence for years and years and so excited to finally see her. Um, as her bio says, she lives near her grandchildren in Minnesota because she knows what matters in life and on the page. And she comes to Tree Lines with the legacy of those poets whose work, every poem lifts us off any mental plane we were on. Uh, I'm thrilled that Peach Tree is not in my poured over copy of her collected Rival Gardens, as it means that there'll be another book. And I can't wait to read every poem. So Connie, I invite you to read Peach Tree. Oh, you're muted. Still muted. Nope, no luck. Hmm. Oh. Bottom up, bottom left, maybe. Try, try it now. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, it has a little post will not allow me to unmute. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I tried unmuting it. It could be very wise. All right. Peach tree. She hacked a hole in the desert gravel with her sharpened pick and planted it last fall, a naked stick. She was already fonder of this brave little tree than she'd been of any man. When red buds finally blanketed the spurs, she remembered her second child 60 years ago, nearly dying of measles. Then the blossoms sprang open and swarming bees were instantly in love. To say the tree thanked her for water was not fanciful nor could she thin the blooms, which she cried. She'd been put under the way they did for the birth of each of her six. Cheated, she thought now. She'd stay until she saw peaches, real peaches. Honey, thank you so much. So wonderful to hear that poem um, with all it carries and I remember the first time I took out a book of your poems and stopped on the library steps before I even got anywhere so I could start reading your metaphors to a friend. Um, can you describe the experience of being caught in that magnetic pull between a metaphor's two players? I mean, in this case, the peach tree's astounding ability to hold your mom and even her history. Can you remember anything about finding that match and did it allow you to speak with such candor about her life or did the candor about her life that you knew up front just showed itself on, on the tree? Um, I just, so just interested in if you can remember when this sort of life force thing that happens of seeing the relationships between two disparate parts of the world when you first started delighting it and, and how it happened with this poem. I think uh, really, the, it began with my mother being ill and she died recently. She was 97 and right up to the end, she was a very fierce person. <laughs> and, um, and I had watched her plant this tree. And I think that what I really felt was that the tree was another daughter. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's the where the place that the metaphor began. But I think that the way it is for me, I don't know how it is for other people, but 
metaphors like have a way of being an open door into the poem. They, they, they show me the way and they teach me what I, I, why I notice a particular thing. I don't know why I notice a particular thing until I get started. So, but I've always had um, a particular affection for metaphor, which is why I love your poems. Well, when you said what I really, I think you said something about, I remember what I really thought and that quality, that authentic, this is what it's like to be seeing the world, to be taking it into consideration and to only be following the truth of it. Um, you know, I, I just prize that so much in the poems and it comes through so clearly here. Um, but in that, in that part where your mom, where your mother asks like, but which would I cut, you know? And, um, that happens in the book a number of times, you know, that really the, the perception of this living thing, um, we, you know, that we feel it, we, we feel it's, we, we feel its own life. Um, so I just want to thank you if there, um, you know, I, I, the, the, it's funny how some metaphors stay with you even though there can be hundreds in a person's work. Mm -hmm. And the very first one that I read to a friend and that I still remember was in um, the poem that talked about a bulb of garlic, like a hobo's sack. Yeah. And <laughs> that, that you can bring to us and let us keep these things and understand more about them, as you say, that this is the way in, this is the way to understand more about what our relationship to the world is. Um, I really appreciate that you, that you came and talked to us about it with this poem. So thank you, Connie. If I could just say one thing, Please. my mother would love this anthology because she loved trees so much and in her life, I. She planted many, many, many trees. She even planted, she planted a thousand little tiny seedling trees when she, after she had the first four of us and we, we were living on a little rural five acres and she, and she planted um, a thousand little seedlings um, in the middle of changing diapers. You know, she just loved trees and, and uh, she would love this anthology. Also, she would really love the fact that I wrote a poem about her. <laughs> she would like that. That's great. I'm so glad it holds all of that. Um, thank you so, so much. And now, even though I, would, I could keep going, I wanted to um, turn this over to Jenny and the poets who she will introduce. Thank you to my two poets. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Um, well, um, Esther Lynn will be the first of the two poets um, that I'll ask questions of. We came across Esther Lynn's poem, Winter, in the New England Review, and we were immediately struck by its stone by stone reconstruction of, and this is a thing in the poem, how um, stone by stone, a cloister was brought from Spain to upper Manhattan. And in the reconstruction is of um, the experience of immigration, reconstruction and a deep questioning of immigration. So I'll ask Esther to read and then I'll have a couple of questions for her afterward. Here's Esther. Hello, thank you. Um, thank you so much, um, Jennifer, um, Fred, of course, and Jessica, of course, for organizing this book. I just really wanna say thank you to Jennifer because she um, tracked down an elusive poet who was buried under just life and COVID and circumstances at the time. They were putting the, uh, this beautiful book together. Um, so this poem is a bit of a collage. So it's written in sections. Um, so I'll just begin. Winter. 
In order to see my first pear tree, I took three trains to a cloister shipped stone by stone from Spain to Washington Heights, then reconstructed to a more perfect whole, enclosing gardens laid by scholars of tapestry and stained glass and the poetry of flowers, treatises on horticultural virtue, and inside one of these, a tree. Not knowing cold, my brother was seized when he stepped from the plane. Once an ice pop shared among three, cold could be laid on the kitchen board and cut carefully by our father. We watched carefully into equal pieces to place in our mouths and suck. With my husband, I wanted to be as children, sex a discovery we could publish, win scientific prizes for. I stroked his nipple to make it true, true as children making their way through a house until someone bled, someone got angry, and then we tiptoed. Before he died, my father said what no one wished to hear. We should have stayed. In the place of marble, we weighed stone pine and magnolia. The difference being the stone pine is native to Italy, Lebanon, and Syria, and the magnolia evolved before the appearance of bees. And my brother stood between two planters, speckled in their shade, saying over and over, I don't know, they both feel like him to me. Thank you so much, Esther, for reading that amazing poem. Thank you. There is a shocking moment in the poem that I hope you all um, noticed. And it's when the father of the family says, quote, what no one wished to hear, we should have stayed. It shocked me because it breaks a taboo. No matter what difficulties are faced by immigrants in their new country, the act of immigrating is one of hope. And the idea that the decision to leave one's country could have been a mistake is rarely admitted to. In my mind, it's akin to saying that the American dream can turn out to be nightmarishly hard. I'm wondering if you had these words of the father in mind when you began writing Winter, if they were the reason you wrote the poem or if they emerged in the process of writing it. Oh, um... Oh, this was a two-part question. Uh, yeah, and I, I actually asked the second part. Sorry. <laughs> um, not. Um, I'm sorry. No, of course. Like it, it came about organically. Um, I suppose I I'm surprised to be part of this anthology, surprised and pleased um, because I hadn't really thought about the trees that populate the poem. Um, I don't think about them as. Um, I, I don't really think about them as a metaphor, even though it's tempting to in hindsight. Um, I thought of the trees as primarily what, what me and my family, what I felt we lacked um, when we moved from Brazil um, to New York, um, which was beauty and nature and cultivation in many, many senses of the word. Um, and trying to, and I thought about them in terms of trying to restore these things, beauty, nature, cultivation to my father, the way he once had them in his younger life, lost, regained and lost again. Um, and that maybe we as his children could give them back to him in, um, in his death. Oh, okay, that, that does answer um, my second question as well in the, um, in the beautiful final section of the poem, 
when um, the siblings are weighing the merits of a stone pine and a magnolia as a tribute to the father instead of a headstone. Mm -hmm. um, and the brother says, I don't know, they both feel like him to me. So I, I think you, you answered my question about um, how this way to honor the father was a kind of restoration of what he had lost um, from the natural world in Brazil. I, I'm wondering if you could also talk for a bit about the passage of time in winter. You, you use the word collage, and I think that's very true of the poem. Um, how did you get the idea for um, kind of illuminating different times uh, mm -hmm. in the speaker's life? Because a lot of time passes in the poem. Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Um, there was some way I wanted to write about failure um, and how failure is kind of the dark underbelly of that um, American mythology we don't ever talk about. Um, Americans, we don't fail, we just turn a new page. Um, and that no matter how we interpret failure, um, whether we interpret it as failure or a rejection of failure, um, um, there are some absolutes. You know, hardship is hardship, cold is cold, whether it's your first winter or the first popsicle you, you got to eat. Um, and in some ways, you know, um, I, I would say all of us here, you know, our, ourselves or our ancestors were successful immigrants. Um, and in many other ways, things could have gone better. Um, and we don't talk about the things that could have gone better and the things that you lose along the way. Um, and sometimes it's, it's, it comes down to a sort of, um, um, humanity of being able to break bread together. Um, um, so for example, um, I grew up undocumented and maybe I should have started with uh, that. Um, but I grew up undocumented in the US and even the most sympathetic American citizens will find it a puzzle. Like being undocumented means that you don't exist bureaucratically, but yet you're here. So what does this mean? Is this a successful immigration? Um, but the trees are beautiful. Sometimes you have to take three subways to see, um, which was true for me. You know, I took the seven to the, to the C to the A, I think. Um, sometimes it's a, it's a trial, you know, to get to see something beautiful. And, but then there it is. Um, so I was struggling um, to think about failure and the uh, constants of, of that per pervade the immigrant's life. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, it's one thing that I appreciate so much about the poem is telling that kind of truth that is um, in direct opposition to some of our favorite mythologies. So I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for reading. Thank you. Our, our next uh, reader will be Afa Weaver. And I just want to say, I'll briefly introduce his poem, Leaves. Um, it was one of the very first poems that we had in mind for tree lines. In fact, I would even say that it's one of a handful that sparked the whole idea of creating an anthology because I, I love this poem. The poem is addressed to leaves um, directly and uh, the poet enters their realm uh, in wonderful ways as the leaves surround him in their many millions. So I'll invite Afa to read leaves. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. It's great to be here. It really is. Thank you. Leaves. The lines that make you are infinite, but I count them every day to hear the stories you carry. These are not secrets, but records, things we should know, but ignore. 
If I commit the sin of tearing you from the tree, I find another world inside the torn vein, another lifetime of counting the records of who walked here before, of what lovers lay here holding each other through wars and starvation. Some days I stand here until I lose focus and travel, drifting off out of the moment too full of it, and my legs are now like trees, mindless but vigilant, held into the earth by the rules of debt, what we owe to nature for trying to tear ourselves away. I drift and the pleasure of touch comes again, layers of green in the mountainside, a tickling in my palms. The pleasure is that of being lost here in the crowd of trunks and pulp, the ground thick with the death of you, sinking under my feet as I go, touching one and another, linking myself through until the place where I entered is gone. When I am afraid, my breath is caught in my throat. When I am not afraid, I lift both hands up under a bunch of you to find the way the world felt on the first day. Thank you so much, Alva. Such a beautiful poem. Well, while I was reading and rereading Leaves, I found myself thinking about the lines from Frost's poem, Directive, where um, he instructs the reader to follow him down a country road. And he adds, if you'll let a guide direct you who only has at heart, you're getting lost. In Leaves, in the second stanza, you say, some days I stand here until I lose focus and travel, drifting out of the moment. And then in the third stanza, the pleasure is that of being lost here in the crowd of trunks and pulp, the ground thick with the death of you. I, I had the thought that the importance of being lost is that it allows a kind of finding. And I wondered how important uh, the idea of being lost was to your concept of the poem or the process of writing it. And it bundled in with that is whether um, you had an idea of where the poem was heading when you began or did the poem take unforeseen turns? And if so, if you could say where, where those places were. Um, well, I was living in Taiwan at the time and I was staying in a Zen monastery. Um, having been invited there by a friend who was at that time the director. And I was studying Mandarin in Taipei. And um, I interrupted my studies to take a little break and I went to mainland to spend time with poets that I knew. And uh, then came back to Taiwan, where I also knew poets. And um, so being lost is um, multifaceted because um, the director of the monastery invited me to move there permanently. He said, you should come and stay with us, you know? And I actually thought about it. It's a beautiful place on the Eastern coast of Taiwan. And Taiwan is a kind of rest stop for birds on their migration patterns. And bird watchers from all over the world come to Taiwan just to see and find you know, rare species of birds. And the monastery is built into the side of a, a big, a long steep hill with a giant statue of Guan Yin at the top and trees everywhere and a, a bamboo, a stretch of bamboo that goes up the staircase up to Guan Yin. So every day I walk the stairs up to the statue, even when it rained a little bit and the bamboo, I could hear the bamboo in the wind then look down and see the trees. And I just would get lost, you know? lost and found at the same time, you know? And um, the poem in the second stanza is actually a principle of Tai Chi where you ground yourself, you, you imagine yourself to be as you are, which is, to, which is to say organically placed in this world. And so that's what happened there. 
And I do have to say at different pla places, the, um, the poem takes, uh, I, at times I get this kind of haphazard relationship with the iambic. And so I'll start off and then I'll just lose it along the way to go some other place, you know, kind of a lazy formalist that way. But um, yeah, and then also I should say historically, there was a terrible tsunami in December of 2004. I moved over there in November of 2004 and lived there until the following um, June uh, in 2005. And so that influenced the writing of these, this poem. And there were a few of them that I wrote and um, they became the seed of um, the government of nature. Um, so I was lost, but I was also found, you know, and I just, I just thought a, a single leaf as being a portal to that whole world of embodying, you know, of being in nature or to realizing that I'm in nature. It's sort of like, oh, wait a minute, I am in nature and I'm not an observer. I'm here, I'm a part of this, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, in the poem, um, you yourself become a tree when, you're, when your legs are like planted like, like trunks in, in place so that you really feel that kind of transformation happening. Um, at the end of the poem, uh, one of the things you find um, by touching the leaves is the way the world felt on the first day. And that brought to my mind um, the creation of the world in Genesis before human history. But in the poem's opening stanza, you reference lovers holding each other through war and starvation. And I just wondered about uh, that dichotomy in the poem between uh, rediscovering the world on the first day and seeing the world as already uh, trammeled and full of suffering. I was thinking uh, in terms of incarnation, you know, of coming into this world as it exists. And I had had conversations with poets my age in mainland and also in Taiwan about the history, you know, and um, not only the history more recently in the 20th century, but the early history of Taiwan, when the first um, people arrived from mainland and met the indigenous people in Taiwan. It's a long history, you know? And um, so I was thinking about that. And uh, a conversation I had with um, the husband of a poet in mainland, Wang Xiaoni's husband was a critic and uh, he explained how soldiers had to use their underwear to make soup because they were starving during the war. Um, you know, it's just, um, and then another time I was in Taipei when there was a kind of celebration and all of these old military men from the war um, when um, Shang, Shang Kai-shek of Changchun Guo came to Taiwan. And um, it was a difficult time and they were sitting there and they were so homesick, they wanted to go home you know, and just sort of observing all of that and knowing how complicated that history is and how little we know about it here, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's also in the poem, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny, all of you, thank you. Um, I want to um, briefly next introduce um, Kim Stafford's poem. He couldn't be here, he's in Iceland right now, um, but he sent along a short film of him reading um, his poem that's in the anthology, which is called Lessons from a Tree. And the poem begins with the percussive lines, seed split, root sprout, leaf bud, before it opens out into the actions a tree takes in the course of its life and what we might learn from those actions. So um, I think Sophia will um, play um, this brief video. While it's playing, we'll have in the chat a, a link to Grayson Books and the anthology um, uh, in, in case you'd like to um, use that during or, or after. 
And I, so I hope you enjoy the video. And afterwards, uh, Fred will welcome Jenny Franklin and Jane Hirschfield to read their poems. Thank you. No sound. Mm. Uh, um, uh, we had a problem uh, hearing. Um, could we try that again or should Yeah, we... let's try that again. I'm just gonna try to connect the sound. I'm sorry about that. Oh, no problem. Can you hear the sound now? Yes. Okay, yes. let's start it again. Lessons from a tree. Seed split, root sprout, bud leaf. Delve deep, hold fast, reach far. Sway, bow, lean, loom. Climb high, stand tall, last long. Seed, thicken, billow, shade. Grain, ring, grow, sow seed. Wine, sing, flicker, glimmer, rise by pluck, child of luck, lightning struck, survivor. Hollow, glisten, witness, seed again. Remember, testify, thicken, burn, bleed, heal. Seed, learn. Nest, host, guard, honor, savor. Seed again. Fade, groan, sag, crack, split. Soften, slough, grip, gather. Then arc, swish, sail, fall, settle. Log, stump, slump, sag, surrender, offer, enrich, be duff, enough. Let's, let's do a, a bow of thanks to Kim Stafford in Iceland. Thank you, Kim. Well, just as a, a reflection on, on, the, on the poets and the comments by the editors, isn't it interesting that you, you discover a poem anew every time? These poems feel new, even though we worked with them and discussed them and spoke about how much we loved them. They all suddenly, listening to the authors talk about them, they're new again. And so thank you, thank you so much. I begin with Jennifer Franklin's poem. Let me just begin by saying something about the word suffering. Suffering always, um, well, first of all, it's in our, our inheritance. We, we always suffer to some degree. And there's always the perplexity that comes with it. Why me? Why now? Why anything? Why this? 
Jennifer Franklin's poetry takes a good, long, hard look at suffering. She helps us do the same thing. And it's her gift as a poet, it seems to me, to fashion a song that knows what suffering actually feels like. And she doesn't, the songs don't flinch from that. To borrow her own title from her own um, book, it's no small gift to do that. She finds her way through pain and in the process shows us how the soul manages to survive and sometimes even thrive despite or maybe because of the hardships it embraces. Jennifer Franklin. Thank you so much, Fred. Thank you all for being here tonight. And thank you for including me in the anthology and in this wonderful reading tonight with some of my favorite poets. This poem is called Memento Mori, Apple Orchard. In the gold light of early October, we climb the orchard hills, searching empty trees for apples. The boy at the gate tells us Ida Red, Rome, Crispin, and Surprise are all ripe and ready for our hands. We walk and walk. The dog investigates every fallen apple with her frantic nose. Even as we savor this autumn sunlight of our beginning, headlines remind us what is lost. Large families have picked the trees clean leaving plastic bottles and paper napkins blowing like white flags. Instead of the fragrant apples on the ground, reminding me of my mother's baking, I catch the smell of decay. I catch the smell of decay as we walk through so many rows of stubby trees that we cannot find our way back to the car. We do not say what we're thinking, if we leave here without a single apple, it might mean what we have done to the earth cannot be undone. The children who grow up on this imperiled planet will not remember pulling the russet fruit from the branches to bite into its sweet flesh. We see boys throw bruised apples at each other. Still children, they already know what is damaged becomes a weapon. As we pull away, we watch them run the worn paths. Their masks fall as they bend to collect the blemished apples and fill their empty bags. You know, Jennifer, again, just now it happened, that, that sense of what is damaged becoming a weapon. It, it sends chills down my spine. But that's not where I want to begin um, this conversation. All right, as you may know that, and I want maybe folks don't have the book in hand as I do, but I can just hold it up a little bit and say something about this, this the formal dimension of this poem. Would you like to begin that commentary? And, sure. and a little bit about how this poem works as a form? Yes, it's a hinged sonnet. Um, and so the um, in the middle, the last line of the first stanza repeats as the first line of the next stanza. Um, it's in a series in my new book uh, called If Some God Shakes Your House. And there's a series of memento mori poems and they're all sonnets, but this was the only one that for whatever reason decided it needed to be longer than just 14 lines. Um, so I, I turned it into a double sonnet. Um, and it was one of the last poems I actually wrote for this collection. And it, it almost wrote itself. I knew while I was there having this experience at this orchard that I would write a poem about the fact that there were no more apples um, on the trees. And, um, and people searching for them the whole time that we were there. 
let, let's stay a little bit longer with the um, the hinge sonnet. I called it a mirror sonnet because I was thinking of this as these these poems mirroring each other in some way. There was a kind of reflective dimension to it. How is how is it that this kind of um, this formal device works for a memento mori notion or theme? I think that when I was writing this poem, I was thinking a lot about um, the Hopkins poem that was one of the first poems that, that I ever knew and, and loved. Um, and um, my mom and my uncle went to Catholic school and you know they had to memorize a lot of Hopkins, including spring and fall to a young child. And, um, and that was in my mind while, while I was writing the poem and the whole idea of, of autumn being, um, being an ending, the whole idea of memento mori that in, in the autumn as things are dying, you tend to, one tends to look at his or her own mortality more closely. And, um, and while I was there at the orchard, I really thought a lot about the fact that it really felt like the, the end of the world was, was upon us um, with, you know, everything environmental going on, everything that was happening um, in the world at the time. This was October of 2020. Um, the election was about to happen. And I thought that the sonnet form was a good way to investigate it and put it under pressure and really try to examine it, like you said in the beginning, unflinchingly. Uh, but I think it needed more room to than just the 14 lines to to really kind of express what I was what I was trying to say. You know, again, these these moments of that seem afresh. All of a sudden, maybe because of Jenny's remarks about directive and office poem, that, that all of a sudden I started thinking about after apple picking and frost, you know, and this harvest that we're in. It, not a great one, I might add. Um, however, I thought at the time also as a, that the poem was somehow connected to the fall out of the Garden of Eden. These apples are just inevitably um, heading that way. And then as we get to the end, we have boys pelting each other with rotten apples. When did that image come to mind? Well, that, um, that was actually happening, you know, in, in, the, in the orchard. And Honestly, what I was thinking about is all of these school shootings, uh -huh. as well as all of the um, the killings um, of the police um, of of unarmed black people um, and the Black Lives Matter movement in in that summer of 2020. And so I was thinking about um, you know the way that from a young age, you know, boys tend to be to be taught um, about violence and using whatever they can to to perpetrate it. And this connects to that, that tremendous phrase in our imperiled planet. And you know the, the trees are picked clean and the boys are throwing rotten apples at each other. And so I'm starting to wonder by the end of the poem whether or not this poem really was heading in the direction of really trying to understand what is it in human beings, maybe boys, but in human beings that pick things clean mm -hmm. and then start throwing the, the detritus around at each other. Is this, is this some apocalyptic image in the end of what, what, we're, what we're heading toward? I, I hope not, <laughs> but, um, but I, I think that it was a very stark, um, very kind of depressing walk through this orchard. And so it certainly in that snippet of time felt apocalyptic. And that high note. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jenny, so much for your reading and the poem. Thank you. Jane Hirschfield. Hi, Jane, are you okay with your voice? I mean, the mic and all? Yeah, I've unmuted, but if you start echoing, I'll mute again until you stop. Okay. <laughs> all of us, I think, are aware in our bones, in our minds, in our whatever parts, other parts of our body and cells register distress. We all know somehow 
we are in um, a crisis of the biosphere, that life on this planet, our lives, the very idea of life in the future is in danger. However, to borrow a phrase from Bob Dylan, how does it feel? How does that spiritual and material crisis actually feel? I have to confess that to answer that question in even the slightest possible way, I turn to Jane Hirschfield's poems. She writes about many things, not just the ecological crisis of our time, but when this moment comes bearing in on us and we sense, for instance, that the coral reefs of the Caribbean have bleached out. You read the story in the paper yesterday. Then suddenly you think again, oh my God. And you say things like, oh my God, without really knowing if there's a God to help us. When Jane Hirschfield's poetry does touch upon the ecological and spiritual crisis of our time, she lights up the sometimes desolate and I hope sometimes recovering landscape of the lives we actually live. Jane, you're invited please to read your poem, The Tree. Thank you. Thank you each for a most extraordinary event and for just an absolutely staggeringly good book. I, I have to say that as soon as I started opening the pages of this anthology, I realized that by looking through the portal of trees, the anthology actually surveys all of human life, every dilemma, every element, every part of who we are, all seen through this multidimensional book of, of poems speaking with and of trees. So thank you. Um, the tree that this very short poem speaks of, a uh, large tree going to get larger is just outside my window here. So this is a very intimate poem for me. It is foolish to let a young redwood grow next to a house. Even in this one lifetime, you will have to choose that great calm being, this clutter of soup pots and books. Already the first branch tips brush at the window, softly, calmly, immensity taps at your life. In giving space at the end here for a second, let the immensities tap. Jane, um, thank you for telling us that, that that tree is right outside your window. I was wondering, it was one of my questions actually was, is that a tree that you know well, <laughs> you know? So I guess it, I guess you do. And I assume that, um, that the person who planted it might've been you? Oh no. No, no, no. no. It was here before I arrived. <laughs> okay. And that in a way precipitated the poem was the uh -huh. realization. So Mill Valley, where I live, is a town on the hem of Mount Tamalpais. The redwoods were taken off this mountain and shipped across the bay to rebuild the city of San Francisco after the 1906 earthquake and fire. And so early photographs of Mill Valley show a very sunny little town. And what happens with redwoods is they come back from the roots. If the mother tree has taken uh, a, a circle of young trees will arrive. And now Mill Valley is a very shady place because mm -hmm. all of the second growth redwoods have, have been returning for many decades now for over a hundred years. Um, that, that's, that's really just a wonderful description and fact, um, what you just described. Let, let me go to the poem. Um, I love the word immensity. As, as I'm fond of saying when I think about this poem, it's an immense word. And, and so when I read the poem and, I, and read it again and, and again, I keep thinking about the kinds of immensities I may have been lucky enough to meet, but I certainly want to ask you, if, what was going through your mind when that word, immensity, came to mind? Well, you know, the word frightened me a little because I wasn't sure, am I allowed to say immensity in a poem or will it seem 
audacious or sentimental or, um, you know, it, it, it truly worried me using that word. And yet, of course, a fully grown redwood tree is indeed an immense being. And so the tree came by it, honestly, even though it's still now, I don't know, it's probably not an adolescent redwood anymore, because I've been in this house almost 40 years, and, and it was here and pretty good sized when I got here. But it is not yet the great girth of a cathedral tree that we know redwoods left will become. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was signaling, of course, both the immensity of redwoods themselves, their lives, their time span, their witness of place which extends for you know thousands of years, far beyond a human lifetime. But also I did mean whenever I have been asked to define the sacred, um, uh, a realm that I feel profoundly informs any kind of an accurate perspective of our lives. And yet all of the language, the word sacred, the word spiritual, all of the language dismays me a little. And I tend to speak when I'm asked to define it, I say, our sense of what is larger than we ourselves are. And so largeness as a signal of this realm beyond ego, beyond the personal lifespan, uh, all of that is held in this idea of the redwood. And you know, for me, it really was very obviously, if I don't have to choose in my own lifetime and the house stands, somebody will have to choose because right now it truly is the tips of the branches and they do tap at the window. That is, uh, that, that small word is actually very accurate to what they are doing, but someday the trunk and the house will be in conflict. And the poem is trying to say, um, if there is a choice to be made, mm -hmm. choose the tree, because the tree is larger than we are. It is primary to my human inhabitants of its neighborhood, and it should get to stay. And that, of course, is a small way of pointing at uh, my feeling about uh, the beyond human world in general, the world of other humans and my relationship to that, and the world that none of us would be able to sustain taking a breath in if it were not for the other beings that we share it with. Thank, thank you so much for, for those observations. And, and I love that word tap, tapping. You know, and I, I think of it as a nonviolent word. In fact, I had it in my mind as a contrast to the, to the boys pelting each other with apples, you know, that, that tapping is, you know, tapping is sort of, it, it, it's, it, it does imply a relationship, <laughs> you know, tapping on the shoulder. And of course I know, and I know you know too, that, that there is a conflict latent inside of this. I mean, and trees do sometimes tip over even and, and so forth. But, but at the moment in which the, the human and the quote non-human meet and there's a tapping, that seems to me a model of something decent. You know, or at least in a desire to have something decent. Um, yes, yes. Uh, and, uh, it is a kind of invitation, perhaps. You know, when someone taps at your window, right. <laughs> they are inviting your attention. They are inviting you to remember that they exist and that, as you say, there is a relationship. And so this is this tree, this actual tree, um, is also uh, the largeness tapping at my life reminding me, yes, you are, you are part of this too. And in fact, there is no conflict. Um, I have to say I have begun tip pruning the branches um, because I don't really want my windows broken. And, uh -huh. and another tree, a Monterey cypress, which uh, uh, those were planted in Mill Valley and they have a way of coming down when they reach a certain age. And one of them did in fact go through, I have an outside, uh, being California, a former garage was turned into my writing studio and a Monterey Cypress came down in a huge storm and went right through the roof and, and you know, took, took it out. And I was out there foolishly in the storm with cardboard boxes, rescuing all of my poetry books before they got soaked. 
I, I think we're going to end with that sense of the beyond. Um, as I read this poem, um, I treasure all of the white space, all of the silence of the white space, and, and sense that the words sort of come in, not quite floating, but, but they are, but they are, you know, there's a, there's a relationship between these words and that white space and the silence it implies. And I, I started to think that the poem, that the tree is silent in its way, in the human way, but it's not silent, you know, and it's just a silence from a human point of view. And I thought, oh my, Jane has many, many poems in which the silence plays a, de a deliberate and specific kind of role. Could you say a word about the silence in this poem? Well, it's almost an oxymoron to speak of silence, and yet I do quite regularly. Um, you know, I, I think silence is where the real work of language happens, because language must be heard and it must be taken in. And for that to happen, we need a spaciousness. We need to stop talking and to listen, and then to listen beyond the words to the fullness of our own lives and to the fullness of everyone's life. And that all happens in the silence, I think. Um, it is one reason why, with the uh, exception of prose poems, and I actually love prose poems, you know, why are poems written with extra white space on the page? Uh, it is to signal what happens within, inside, outside, beyond, and continuous with, but not restrained by the rational mind's relationship to language. Music would make no sense without the pauses between the notes. Our lives make no sense without the silences between the speech. Thank you, Jane. I think that what, what I want to say is the rest is silence, but it's not actually. <laughs> Um, we have another 10 minutes that we could talk and I'm, I thank you for this poem and for these words and I'm going to turn the mic over to Jess and maybe to invite any any remarks or, or questions from the chat listing. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, everybody. And um, oops. thank you, everybody. And I, I do want to open up um, the evening to maybe a few, we have time for a, a few comments, but I just wanted to say uh, the part about these being American poems in this moment and the relationship between what we've been hearing and how people make meaning by speaking the truth and the urgency that can have. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about that part in Connie's poem where we get to understand that her mother did not get to have the experience of creation that was hers to have. And that we, in the, in the choosing, in the finding, in the metaphors finding us, the urgency to really articulate um, what it means to be a person and all our concerns and our complaints and our praises. Um, I just wanted to say that there, to me, something particularly democratic and American about that as Whitman would have it. Um, so um, just wondering, and we just have a couple minutes and um, let's see, I think Sophia is going, are you going to manage the chat? Who is going to manage the chat or? Am I? Um, I can manage the chat, but we okay. don't have any questions so far. So everyone in the audience, if you've got a question, please go ahead and add it to the chat now. One thing we do have is a lot of comments and thanks to all of the poets who read and thanks to the editors, we're seeing a lot of that and we will save the chat 
and send it to all of the readers and the editors so that when this is over, you can see what everyone wrote to all of you. Uh, but if there are any questions, you could type something into the chat right now. Or if you editors have any other questions for the, the poets that you felt that you didn't get a chance to ask, you could do that as well. Or we could just think about Jane Hirschfeld's plea for, for silence. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's a question. Um, the question was, what is a sustainable poem? Um, um, what is a sustainable poem in your view? Um, wait, I lost that question. Oh yeah, question. what is the sustainable poem in your view? And um, I, I, maybe this is open to any of the readers, anyone who wants to unmute themselves to answer that sustainable poem. Before anybody, if, while people are deciding whether they're gonna answer, just seeing everybody here um, and, you know, being in the world of everyone's work and everyone's attentions, just, you know, really this is, this is what the anthology is about. Sustainable poem, um, I can answer from one kind of reading of the question. As you know, those, those poems that stay with us because they have made meaning that continues to inform us and that continues to connect us. There's so much about it that is connecting um, and being connected to um, the world through the portal. And there were two poems that, that talked about looking at a tree as the beginning of the world and seeing how the world was made and Maya's poem and the beginning of the world and Alpha's poem. So, to me, sustainable is what stays with you, what poems talk to you. Um, we heard some of that in, in the comments that people said, oh, I was thinking of this poem. So anyway, that's one little answer about sustainable. Poems that are timeless, says um, Madeline Beer, who don't know. Thank you. Well, maybe, maybe this is a good place to end thinking yeah. about what sustains us um, in poetry and around poetry. And um, thank you all so much for coming. And yes, thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you to the readers and, their, and the poems. Thank you to the readers. Talk to us. Thank you. Thank you to the Writing Center for hosting us. And thank, yes, you all. thank you to the Hudson Valley. Thank you all. Thank you for being here. And don't forget to buy a copy of the anthology. There's so many other poems that you have not heard tonight that are really wonderful. And some of the poets who wrote them are in the audience tonight. So thank you for, for being here and participating in this. And thank you for letting us record the reading. Um, we will eventually have it on the Hudson Valley Writer Center YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Thank you to Sophia for doing such a great job with the tech and playing Kim's video. We were so glad to be able to see that. And thank you to the editors for producing this incredible anthology. Um, it's definitely my mom's favorite thing that I've ever been published in. <laughs> she loves it. <laughs> That's great. That matters. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. So good to see you all. Be well. Be well. Be well. Take care. Take care. Take care. All right. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, Fred. bye, Jenny. Bye, Jenny. I'm hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Where did Jess go? <laughs> I think, I think she I think she left the meeting. Yeah.
on Federico. Go. But thank you. Yeah, it's time. Uh, it's time. But thank you. Thank you so much. And, and it was so good to hear these poems. So it was good. great. It was really wonderful. And we'll see you at another Tree Lines reading soon on Zoom. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> More Tree Lines. More tree lines. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Hi, Bob. Hi, Gary. Hi, Jennifer. Bye. Good night, everyone. Good night.